Hi, and welcome to Something to Talk About. I'm Linda McNamee, and for the next hour, we will have a lively discussion. Um, so, but I'm gonna hold that just for now. You'll be surprised unless you've looked at my show's webpage, which now has 196 likes. Can you be the 200th? 200th like on my Facebook page because this is also episode number 50 so we're pretty proud of that. Um, if you are home this snowy evening still trying to figure out how to dig out from Snowmageddon you can give us a call at 781-270-9199. I still haven't memorized that number or if you have a question, comment, thought, anything afterwards, and we are not live, you can always email me at talk at bcattv.org. And as usual, I would like to thank the, the crew tonight. We have Corey McNeil and Mike Duvall and Kyle Ruffin, who are all staff members here at BCAT, keeping the place up and running now that they have unburied the studio. And we also have Colleen Moore, who is a volunteer extraordinaire and master director. So thank you, Colleen, for digging yourself out to make it here. And last but definitely not least, I want to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home for Daddy Date Night. Hopefully, um, Gwyneth has behaved herself and has gone to bed at a reasonable hour because I know Evan was already conked out and asleep in dreamy land before I left. So thank you. And now I would like to introduce our wonderful guest, Adrian Simone, correct? Simeone. Simeone. Oh, I always forget to double check. No, it's okay. So thank you for joining me. Thank and you for you having me. you have established, started an organization called the Mama Bear Effect. Yes. Which is pretty serious stuff. We're talking about child sexual abuse. Child sexual abuse, yeah. Very serious issue in this country and wow. in the whole world, really. Wow. It's like one of those things that you never really talk about. So if you don't talk about it, it's not there, but that's not the case. If it doesn't affect you, it's pretty easy to ignore it. Yeah. But for the people that are experiencing it, the children, it's something they're suffering in silence. And it's affecting so many people that we're now at a point where a lot of survivors are speaking out mm -hmm. and are coming out. And, you know, there's a mixed reaction from society about this whole issue because yeah. it is so uncomfortable. Like, well, why haven't you talked about it in 20 years? Well, let's back up a little bit. I did thank you. And I want to thank you again because there's a lot of snow out there. Yes. And everybody's going a bit stir crazy. And yeah. No, I was happy to get out of the house to get a little escape. So but hopefully my husband's <laughs> getting our three kids put to bed okay. So. Daddy date night! Yes, he's, I'm Woo. sure he's thrilled right now. I'm sure it's it's so a good time. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, how you came to Burlington, why you became interested in such a significant and serious topic? Mm -hmm. um, I think growing up, I had a grandmother that started a nonprofit in Charlestown cool. called Mrs. B's Gardens. And she worked with uh, children in public housing. She lived in public housing mm -hmm. and she started this organization where they were cleaning up the areas in front of the public housing oh. and she got kids involved and rather than them focusing on you know just fooling around or mm -hmm. getting into involved with gangs they started working with her learning about gardening and it was a really cool. productive thing for them so and it's also learning about you know plants and yeah right. which is cool. something that most kids in the projects aren't really going to have much experience with and you have a reward where there's free food yes exactly unless it was flower gardens it was both she oh. did a bunch of stuff um, so that was really she was a really inspirational kind of lady and you know in the years that I knew her she always wanted to do more. She was always inspiring people mm. to find their purpose and, you know, make their mark in the world. Wow. So I kind of always had that in me to look for my purpose in life, my opportunity Sounds to Sounds like give a back. both nature nurture thing, yes. you know, genetically you were yes. already inclined thanks to grandma and just seeing her as a great role model. Yes. So I grew up on the South Shore mm -hmm. and when I met my husband and we were getting married, his business was located in Somerville and right where Good Times used to be. Okay, yep. And they were tearing it down. So in the process of us trying to find a house to live, he was also looking to relocate his entire business. Oh. So we ended up here in Burlington, which is a great location. I like it. Yes. As my neighbor says, it's not so bad. No. 
it isn't. It's, it's great. So, so are. now, did you, you know, did you go to school studying nonprofit management or? I went to Babson College. I got um, my degree in marketing and entrepreneurship. Oh, and okay. I spent, so that was related. I spent a lot of my time working for my family business. So okay. I actually started from the bottom up. My father owns a wholesale food manufacturing company Ooh. called Boston Salads. Okay. They make deli salads, chicken salad, Ooh. coleslaw. They distribute cold cuts and soups and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. So I worked in production, I worked in distribution, and then wow. I was inside sales, I was outside sales, and then towards the end I was doing some management position. Okay. And then I had, you know, my daughter, and it just kind of, you know, now I have three kids. Wow. Five, three, and uh, eight months. Oof. So I obviously have my hands full on it. Yes, I'm, you do. I, you know, I'm not working, you know, oh, yes, anymore you are. for him. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, oh, yes. I took a step back and decided okay. to stay home and spend some time, you know, being a mom. Oh, okay. So how did you discover, you know, the, the issue or the mm -hmm. problem of child sexual abuse and what made you actually go out and establish mm -hmm. the Mama Bear Effect? And where'd you get the name? It's kind of fun. Yeah. In 2012, I had read an article regarding child pornography that just broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like I needed to find a way to be involved in the solution. That I didn't want to just sit and cry about it and get over it. That I felt like I, if I was really that upset about it, I needed to take some proactive steps to okay. be part of the solution. So I started doing a lot of research and what I found was really shocking, the fact that one in four girls and one in six boys wow. are estimated to experience physical sexual abuse before they turn 18. It's called the silent epidemic, and it's yeah. so true because it's affecting so many people in our country, and yet there's so little awareness for it. It's just, right. it's heartbreaking. So as I learned more, I felt like there were lots of great ways that people can protect kids and empower children, mm -hmm. but that people are afraid of it. That's really the issue. And so that's kind of where my, my marketing mind kind of came through. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what is the problem? How can we market this in a way that will make people feel more comfortable about so just, receiving this information? So you're just kind of heightening the awareness that there is a problem Right, here. that's the first step. Because okay. a lot of people, I think like yourself, weren't even aware that yeah. this is such a serious problem. And then the second part of the issue is that there's fear, that people just, it's so upsetting, they don't want to be disturbed by it, or they don't want to just accept that this is actually a reality and okay. that it's a risk for their children. So some people take the act that they would rather pretend that mm -hmm. it's, it's not real or that it couldn't happen to their child. So when I was looking at the names of other organizations, a lot of it focuses on abuse, you know, stop abuse. Um, and I kind of wanted to do something more like the positive empowering. Okay. So um, a friend of mine a while ago back had referred to herself in a position where she stood up for her child and then she said her mama bear came out and so that always stuck with uh, me yeah and we were we had been talking about it one time and it's it's actually this chemical reaction that they've studied in mothers really yes it's, they call it the mama bear effect it's, it's this chemical reaction especially when a mother is nursing that gives them a more aggressive nature when they feel that their child's at risk so I just, you know, and, and not that that has to be this situation. I think a yeah. lot of people that if they feel a strong bond with their children and are very connected with them mm -hmm. are going to obviously do more to And it's to that protective sense, yes. too. It's yes. So rather cool. than people be afraid of the abusers, I want abusers to be afraid of these empowered oh. parents. And I want empowered parents to do feel. not mess with me. Exactly. <laughs> oh, they say right. never get between a mother bear and her cub. I would follow that advice. Exactly. So I've kind of, you know, taken that spin. Oh, because I, and, okay. and then, too, people don't necessarily know what it's about at first. So rather than them say, okay, this is about sexual abuse, I don't yeah. want to know about this, they say, mama bear effect, what's that? And it kind of gives them an opportunity to it's be open. It's like warm, fuzzy. Yes. Oh, yeah. So That marketing background yeah. is kicked in. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, will reach out to us and say, I always call myself a mama bear. Or my husband says he's a papa bear, you know, and so okay. it's, you know, it's kind of cute, but, you know, there's some real meaning behind it. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So now is the mama bear effect 
an advocacy group? Does it go into legal counsel? Or is it just kind of working at educating the public? I mean, what's your mission? My mission is to empower every single person that wants to raise awareness in their community to give them the tools to do that. Basically, in my mind, the mama bear effect is the change that we could have over this whole country if all the good-hearted people that care about children mm -hmm. took action for this cause. Wow, okay. So when I was looking for information, I felt like I wanted to get involved, but I wasn't really seeing a lot of opportunities to do so. Uh, okay. And there weren't a lot of materials, so I myself have created this website with all this information that I've learned from mm -hmm. all of my research, and I've created a lot of tools, programs and brochures, and you know, Rock the Talk bookmarks uh, okay. to help people spread it throughout their community. Okay. Now I normally save this for the end of the show, but with all of this marketing that you're doing, do you do any fundraisers or do you accept donations or how do you fund all of this? I, I sell t-shirts online. I sell okay. the materials online pretty much at okay. cost and to cover the shipping costs. And we did do our first uh, real fundraiser last year, okay. um, which was, it was a great success. We raised a few thousand dollars, Excellent. which was wonderful for us because it doesn't take a lot of money for mm -hmm. us to do what we need to do, but there is, you know, there is some need for financial support. And surprisingly, we do, we do receive a lot of donations online, oh, excellent. Um, which is, it's, you know, there's no way to really thank these people mm -hmm. for supporting us. You know, it means, it means the world to me that people are willing to support what we're doing. Okay. Now you say we, do you have a staff or is it just kind of like you we're a 501c3 nonprofit okay. organization, so we do have a board of directors, oh, and we wow. meet and you know kind of have powwows about how to you know attack the issue and how to get involved. So you like hit the ground running because you said you read this article in 2012, yeah. and here it is early to really yeah. early 2015, yeah. and yeah. Well, I have wow. a lot of amazing connections in my life that I think have, have set me up for this okay. moment. I my neighbor across the street, Laura Messing, okay. is. Um, the founder of Design Invasion, a graphic design firm here oh, in Burlington. Okay. So when I saw her and I saw her work, I was I said to my husband, "This is the real deal." Across yeah. the street. So I kind of said, "Hey, Laura, do you want to help do a logo for me?" And she's like, "Of course." Of course. So that was amazing. Here, twist my arm. Go I know. Twist. And then I had a I have a cousin who's a lawyer, so he pretty much just hooked me up with a friend of his in, in Boston, and oh, they okay. they helped me form the whole corporation. Excellent. So it was it was amazing. Okay. Now, you said you focus on child sexual abuse. Do you provide advocacy for other forms of abuse, or do you limit it to just child sexual abuse? I have done a little bit of research in terms of physical abuse and neglect. It's a much more complicated um, issue. Child okay. sexual abuse is very particular um, in terms okay. of how we can protect kids. Um, physical abuse and neglect is often perpetrated by the parents. Child sexual abuse is often happening with children whose parents love and want to protect them. And okay. it's happening either within the family unit and the parents are not aware, okay. or outside of the family and the, pa the parents are often trusting these people with their children and not realizing the risk. Now how often is it a parent who is sexually abusing their child. Is that common or is it usually like a babysitter or an uncle or you know crazy cousin Louie or? The one thing that's a little bit challenged about this issue is that due to the lack of funding and awareness in terms of studies you know researching exactly who the offenders are it's more broad. It's the, the statistics say that there's like between 30 to 40 percent of perpetrators are family members, which could be parents, okay, so grandparents, it really does, it's siblings, yes. A big umbrella. Yes. Now, okay, that's family but, members. But parents is, is very common for oh, our page, oh, you know, a lot of our supporters. Okay. It, was, it was a parent. Okay. How many statistically are complete strangers? Less like, than 10 percent. Oh, okay. Which a lot of people. Like the, hey, little girl, I lost my puppy. You want right. to get in the car? Yeah, right. Stranger kind of. danger. Actually, people fear strangers. Kids are actually safer out in public now than they were 20, 30 years ago, and that's something that people <laughs> that's still what have my it in their let head. Let me go running around <laughs> outside. Yeah, but the the real risk is very small. I, if you look on 
the national website for missing and exploited children. There's generally only about 100 to 115 children that are kidnapped in the typical kidnapping stranger situation. Uh -huh. Most missing children are runaways or if they are kidnapped, like they're kidnapped battle. actually by someone they know. Uh, okay. You know? A lot of times it's it's like a... A custody battle, custody battle. or, you know, a ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, you know, doing it to, to punish them in some way. There but are licenses for everything else. Why can't there be a license to have kids, I you know? know? I know. <laughs> it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be a parent. I think so. And an honor. So... How often is sexual abuse accompanied by, or accompanied, yeah, by either like a physical abuse mm -hmm. or, I'm assuming emotional abuse comes with it because, Absolutely. you know, by default it's, yes. so is it usually, you know, does one start before the other? Like, is there a physical abuse relationship and then the sexual abuse comes in? Or has that not led, been looked at? Or With, A lot of the statistics come from the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which was run by the CDC in the 1990s, uh, okay. it was begun, which involves 17,000 people that agree to take these surveys and have physical exams done so that then later in life, they can revisit these exams and see how their body has responded. Um, so a lot of these people that took the survey, uh, I think it was about 30% of them reported having physical abuse. And then another 30% 30, 30%, you know, it was 25% of the females and 16% of the, the males uh, reported sexual abuse as well. Oh, wow. So, but in terms of the two together, I can't remember the okay. combination, but it, you know, it's, it can happen in so many different mm -hmm. situations. A lot of times there wasn't necessarily physical abuse evolved, okay. I would say. And sexual abuse oftentimes is not physically harmful to the child in terms of, right. you know, bruises and, and mm -hmm. cuts and stuff like that. Oh, okay. It's, it's a different yeah. kind of abuse. And I think a lot yeah, of people, uh, that's a, a misconception a lot of people have, sexual abuse oftentimes is done under the guise of love and affection. Uh, and so it's a mental manipulation of the child taking advantage of their naivete and um, actually, you know, taking advantage of the fact that sexual abuse feels good to the child, and so <laughs> therefore the child doesn't realize that what they're doing is actually inappropriate. Uh, okay. Now, speaking of child, is there like a target age where children first become? sexually abused? Does it start in like a preschool year generally or 10 years old or teenagers mm -hmm. or has any study been done to kind of map that? From out? the research that, the, that they have published, children under the age of five are often abused by a family member. Okay. That's when they are not usually out, you know, in, they in don't school have exposure events, to anybody else. Um, but okay. they're also much more naive and okay. they're not aware so it's much more easy to take advantage of them. Um, and unfortunately, due to the popularity of child pornography, it actually has increased demand for children at younger and younger Ooh. ages. So yeah. it's, it's, really, it's really hard stuff. You know, it really breaks my heart, but that's why we're, why we're the adults, because okay. we need to take responsibility and you know, protect our kids. Okay. Now, um, Tang, I I have my little cheat sheet here because I love going on tangents. With the advo advocacy that you do, do you make presentations at schools or how do you get your message out? My first thought when I started the, um, the whole organization was I did a Facebook page. Okay. I figured social media was free. Yeah. And you know, you know, with the power of the people, anything can get spread. Mm -hmm. So. Which I, I have liked your Facebook page. Yes, thank you. Um, so a lot of it's online. Okay. Um, and then, you know, here in Burlington, I've done some community events, and I've worked with other advocates across the country. I've, we've helped people up in Alaska do wow. parades, stuff like that. So pretty much any time anyone across the country or even around the planet wants to raise awareness, we're pretty much here saying, okay, let's put our minds together and let's do something. Okay. When I first started, I did a door hanger campaign where I oh. ordered 20,000 door hangers for people to walk around their neighborhoods and just hang them on doors. 
Yeah. And with st the statistics and prevention information available. And some people actually decided to take it to the next step and would knock on doors and hand them to people. Mm. And the feedback I got was that people were actually disclosing their child sexual abuse to them for the first time in their life. Wow. To a complete stranger at the door. And I, I, that's yeah, just I was going to ask thing. if there was some kind of follow up to that to yeah. see if there was like. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, what do you do with something like that if somebody all of a sudden, you know, shares their story? Shares their story. Well, actually, my brother got married in October, and a guest came up to me, and she had been following the Facebook page, and she disclosed her child sexual abuse to me for a long time. And you know what? It's a beautiful thing if someone has, they're carrying that burden on their chest, and they feel comfortable sharing it with you. You know, it, it's a beautiful thing. Now, do you feel obliged to help them in some way, or do if you just say are thank you for, for help, sharing? Or yeah, I just you know let them know they're in my heart because it's true. Uh -huh. um, every child out there that's experiencing this is is in my heart, and so people you know ask me how can I face this kind of stuff every day? It's because when you truly care about these kids and you think about you know the fact that they deserve a fair chance, then you just kind of run off that power. You know, it's not discouraging. Um, it's really about making connections with people. Okay. Now, when you were talking about your Facebook page, it just kind of popped another question. Firecracker. Yes. Is an abused child. Yes. Who is going to appear in court? Yes, she has a court appointment next month. She's going to be testifying against her grandfather who began sexually abusing her uh, when she was a toddler. Wow. And her mother had reached out to me um, when this first all came about two years ago through the Facebook page. Oh. So I had kept in communication with her. Okay. Um, but it's very rare for a child as young as Firecracker, she's five, to take Oof. the stand. A lot of times the parents don't want to do it because they're afraid it's going to be traumatizing to the child. The district like attorney. Like the abuse wasn't. Right, you know. exactly. Um, the district attorney might not want to because they're afraid the child might not, you know, might might break down and not say anything okay. at all, um, but they have confidence that she can do it. So Now would this be like live testimony or would she be in a room separate video, you know, like a videotape or? Unfortunately where she is, her grandfather could actually be in the room. Oh, there, wow. They put in a request for a special allowance for him not to be there which uh, okay. it's, it's sad that we're even at the point where people should even have to request this. And the fact that she's even testifying just goes to show how far our judicial system has to go to actually empower these kids. Um, we have children's Well, I think our judicial system. system needs a lot of work yeah. anyway. Yeah. She's, she's already gone through the process of reporting and speaking with a forensic interviewer. This is all on videotape. Okay. But the the, rec the court is making her testify live again. Wow. And answer the questions from the defense. And her <laughs> grandfather doesn't have to say anything. He gets oh, to just sit there and and hold his breath. So we're really rooting for her. Yeah, and that's why, okay. you know, that's just why. Don't I make do eye contact. Don't yeah. make eye contact. Well, hopefully he won't be in the room. That would I be nice. I think they're going to allow that. Let's hope so. Now, are there risk factors for a child to be more susceptible to some form of child sexual abuse? Yes. The number one risk factor for a child for sexual abuse is a special needs child. Children that have disabilities or have challenges in communicating, um, very high risk. Oh, okay. It's almost a certainty that I think it's about 90% of children that wow. have special needs will not only be sexually abused once, they will experience sexual abuse multiple times in their life. So wow. uh, there's a lot of you know outreach that needs to be done for these parents. Um, and obviously they have to trust their children with a lot more people than the normal person would have to in terms mm -hmm. of transportation and different forms of therapies. There are a lot of people that have access to their children. Yeah. And those organizations need to do a better job to provide transparency to these parents so that they know that they're being taken care of. That's got to be hard for the parent just saying, yeah. you know, here, take I my know. kid. Yeah. So. Anyway, I'm yeah. sorry I neglected to wish my best to Firecracker oh, and keep you. us posted on the Facebook page. Oh, absolutely, page, so. yeah. Her mom and I when are chatting. So. roughly, without disclosing too much, 
when is this court date? Is it's it like? She'll, she, within the middle of the February, okay. we should hear back. It was supposed to be this month, but they postponed it, which can happen, so that can right. be frustrating okay. too. So yeah. the child's mentally trying to prepare for it, and, okay. then, and then they have to keep waiting, and, and they just want it to be over with. Okay. Now, how, how do you introduce, you know, you had mentioned 90% being special needs children, but children in general, mm -hmm. how do you approach the subject to teach them that this isn't okay mm -hmm. without, you know, because, you know, I have a, a six-year-old now, and it's like, I've been, you know, failing in the parent category because I haven't brought this up because I don't want to make her paranoid. I don't want to scare her. I don't want to give her nightmares at night, mm -hmm. telling her what could happen if statistically chances are it probably never will. How do you mm -hmm. bring, how, how did you tell your kids or have you? Oh yeah, I mean my daughter, my daughter's five, so okay. she actually has the mentality of why aren't parents talking about this? And you need to go around and you need to tell parents, we need to do signs telling parents to do this kind of stuff. She wants to be here right now. She was, she Past wants, your bedtime. I know, she wanted to know why she couldn't be here, but you could watch you start, on TV tomorrow. Well, just like we, we teach kids what the names of their body parts are. Mm -hmm. So we just don't neglect their, their special private parts, mm -hmm. you know, and we use the real words and you just don't make any, it's not shameful because yeah. if you don't talk about it, they know that they're there and they know that you, that we're not talking about it. So then they feel like okay. this is something I'm not supposed to talk about because mommy and daddy never talk about uh, this. So okay. my, the way I approach it, they're special. They're special. They're what makes you a girl or a boy, and that's a very special thing. And they're private because we're not supposed to share them with other people. Mm -hmm. So it's really not that scary. And I've explained to my daughter that, you know, especially with this girl Firecracker, that her grandfather touched her private parts. And in, in that, you know, it was sad for her that, you know, her grandpa wasn't supposed to do that. And, you know, and she's feeling really sad about it. Um, but you know, yeah, that's another hard thing, putting yeah. it in terms that a three year old or a five year old right. can can grasp. Yeah. Yeah. I think as long as we don't make it seem like it's a big deal, um, it doesn't have to be a big deal for them. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we teach them that could potentially scare them. I, I scare the heck out of my kids about chewing their food so they don't choke. Yeah. I terrify oh, them about running into the street. You know, so I think there's a yeah. lot of I think I mean fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't think my kids have nightmares about choking okay. on their food or, you know, getting run over by Ooh. a car, you know. So I, I think it's just one of those natural things yeah. that we, we're afraid of scaring them. But I think, honestly, we're afraid, of, we're afraid of scaring ourselves, thinking that this could happen to our kids. That might be the case. Be yeah. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, somebody had given my daughter a book. It was a Winnie the Pooh book, and it was about, you know, stranger danger. I'm like reading this book to my four-year-old. She was four at the time. I'm like, I don't want her knowing about this. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want her freaking out that she can't talk to anybody new. Right. And it's like, okay, you can talk to somebody. You can talk to a stranger if there's a grown-up with you. If mommy right. or daddy's there, then it's okay to say hi. You can say hi and then just move on. You don't have to like freak out. Yeah. So okay, all right. I'm just, you know. There's no manual for being a parent either. I know. So it's I like, know. okay, how do you it's not tough. scar this child for life? Yeah, I mean, even if we mess it up, it's okay. I think as long as we're talking about it, I think that's really the first major step is making okay. it something that we can communicate to them. So that way, um, if there's a problem that they feel like they can tell us, um, you know, because yeah. they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be afraid. They, we should I remember, be. You know, I'm probably going to screw it up, but I remember reading something about if your child comes to you with what you see as a little thing, it's a big thing to them. Right. So if you don't teach them right. to acknowledge the little things, then yeah. when it's it is. It's about listening to them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When a three-year-old gives you a pretend phone, you answer it. You <laughs> exactly, know. yeah. Drop well, I mean, I, I think I, as a society, we have this I idea that because kids don't know as much as we know, that they don't deserve as much respect as we do. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that we promote on the page is about children having body autonomy, that when family comes over, you do not have to hug someone that you just met for the first time because mommy and daddy's telling you, oh, this is your great aunt, yeah. you need to hug her, and that's a sign of respect. 
affection is not a sign of respect. Yeah. We don't go hugging strangers all over the place. We're like, I have to get to know you. I have to feel yeah. comfortable with you. But yeah. here we are telling our kids, no, you do that. And you know, that's something that a lot of people are adopting as a new idea that, no, you're right. That makes sense. Yeah. My child is a person with rights and feelings. Then you have the double standard with the, here, go see Santa or go see the right, Easter Bunny. Right, and, and I'm a big proponent. The child obviously does not, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a terrifying thing. And basically it says to the child, my parents are forcing me to do a terrifying thing and I have to do it. Yeah. And the, honestly, and that's what happens a lot of times with, you know, family members and stuff like that. They feel like they have to submit to it because this is a person of authority and uh, that they don't have a say. And so that's one of the things. Yeah, we it's hard to differentiate yeah. in their minds. Yeah what is acceptable you know because right. like you said adults have the history where they know what is appropriate and right. what is not yeah. now how common is child sexual abuse to be just like a one time event or is it usually like in order to be considered abuse does it have to be repeated you know, it Does that all make depends. Sense? It all depends on the child and okay. the situation. Um, you could be raped by a neighbor on a one instance, and that could give you post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of your life. Okay. And you know, so it doesn't matter if it's once or a bunch of times. It, it all affects the child in a different way. It all depends on how they look at the abuse, what was said to them, and how often it happened. It, mm -hmm. You know, every situation is unique. Now, is there a statistic or has anybody ever looked at how long the abuse happens or the time frame from when the abuse started to when the victim actually admits it or mm -hmm. seeks help? Mm -hmm. Has there? The statistics are that 50% of kids will wait at least a year to tell someone and that only 25% of kids um, will tell someone within within five years. And that wow. there, there are a lot of kids that don't tell. And it's so. because there's been this social taboo about... This, the taboo is oh, shame. Okay. Um, I think kids understand a lot more than we give them credit and for. And a lot of times, you know, the child is guilted into, it's your fault that this right. happened to you, and they don't want to admit that they didn't, but they don't. They believe they made a mistake or something. Right, it's well, they feel like, if, you know, if the parent has taught them that you know this kind of touch is wrong they might feel like oh no I didn't stop this from happening it's my fault and my, you know I mean there's there are oh, a million okay. things that these kids are told um, to manipulate and control them that you know this is what love is or your mommy knows okay. what's going on you know or I'm gonna you know hurt someone that you love or you you know they create your mommy's not gonna love you anymore right if you yeah no one will no one will like you anymore um, so, you know, it's, it's emotional warfare for the child, oh, yeah. basically. Yeah. Wow. It's, you know, a lot of people, I've seen comments when I read articles online, a lot of people will say, I don't see what the big deal is. And it's like the big deal is it's not so much about what happens to their body, it's about what happens to their mind. Yeah. And especially children at a young age, their brains are still forming. So there's been cr increasing okay. um, evidence about how sexual abuse and physical trauma and mental abuse changes the way their brain reacts to situations. So it literally is changing their brain for the rest of their life. Wow. That's intense. Yeah. Wow. So what is your advice for families to minimize the opportunity for sexual, child sexual abuse to happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, we already talked about, you know, don't go see Santa if it's gonna freak you out and mm -hmm. don't hug great Aunt Myrtle because right. you've never met her before. Yeah. How? Well, basically, there's three components that you should be educated. You should educate yourself okay. and your children. I mean, we have a, an entire three pages of our website is dedicated to empowering your child in well, an age-by-age age okay. fashion because it's also not just about protecting the child. It's also about promoting non-abusive behaviors so that child doesn't okay. abuse another child. Okay. So there's a lot about consent, teaching kids what consent is, okay. um, respect, just moral responsibility, and having compassion for other people. You know, understanding that everyone has feelings, and if you're doing something to someone, you're affecting the way they feel. Yeah. 
Okay. And a lot of a lot of kids don't get that. I mean, it's going to take time for them mm -hmm. to get that lesson, but it's it's one of those things. That's our job to teach our kids. That's not something that they're okay. supposed to learn in school. So especially like bullying is a big problem. The two right. and the two are related in many ways. Yeah, because it seems a, like a power struggle. Right. Or not a, right. a struggle, but right. a power seeking behavior. Mm -hmm. In some instances, there will be warning signs that someone could be potentially abusive. Um, grooming is a word that every parent should know, and grooming it means that you know this perpetrator has selected a family and a child, and they are looking to build trust with that family. They are looking to gain that child's affection and that child's trust, and then break down physical barriers to initiate sexual contact. Okay. So there are a lot of warning signs. Um, that people can kind of look for, especially for single parents. Single parents are actually the second most um, um, vulnerable okay. family unit um, at risk for sexual abuse because um, a lot of times the parent might be emotionally um, vulnerable and okay. looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Um, so they're bringing in another person into their life romantically and is going to be involved with the child most likely. Okay. And they're also, tr they have to trust more people with their child because they most likely they're have to work. Themselves, yeah. yeah, so whether they're living with family and there's more people in the house or they have babysitters or this or that, they're at a disadvantage. They can't be as picky as the rest of us can. Okay. You know? Now, you mentioned some of the warning signs, but could there be somebody who just happens to be a nice person that, you know, may fit this profile? I mean, yep. how often does that happen? Are there ways to distinguish as a parent? I would say that there's no way to absolutely distinguish. There's also, a, there's also called a situational abuser, which is a person okay. who simply finds themselves in a situation where they're alone with a child and they recognize that opportunity. And due to you know, a lower moral standard mm -hmm. or a substance abuse problem or they might be struggling with low self-esteem or depression due to like job loss or okay. a romantic relationship has gone down the tubes. They okay. see that sexual opportunity as a way to kind of have a, a temporary boost in their, you know, their feelings. It's like so a drug. It is, that's, <laughs> and that's why they, they just keep doing it. They're not gonna stop. Okay, do you have or what would your advice be? You know, as a parent, we're talking about wanting to protect our child and want to keep our child safe. And, you know, you don't really want to put a bubble around the child, but no. you just want to give them a safe reality. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to a parent who has one child abusing another one? Mm -hmm. Because you love both these children unconditionally, yet there's that conflict and that unhealthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you have a responsibility to each child to do what's best for them. And for the child that's abusing, that child needs to be in therapy. Mm -hmm. That child has a sexual um, problem that, that needs to be resolved. Either it's a deviancy, it's a curiosity that they just need to be corrected on what's responsible sexual behavior. A okay. lot of children that sexually abuse other children are generally um, beginning puberty. And so okay. that's kind of the age, especially where parents, I think, back off even more about mm -hmm. wanting to talk to their kids about their stuff because they, their kids certainly know what's going on, mm -hmm. you know? And so the parents feel even more like, oh, I don't want to have to talk about this. This is going to be so uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and most likely um, the child has already been exposed to pornography through social media, um, friends with older siblings mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So a lot of times. Yeah, that whole social media thing. I'm yeah. like, I'm dreading, yeah. you know. Yeah, no smartphones for our kids <laughs> when you're 20. Yeah. <laughs> but so, I mean, yeah, both children are going to need therapy. Um, okay. But I, it doesn't mean that that child needs to be loved any less. Okay. Um, if anything, you know, they might, a lot of times, these children who did it out of sexual curiosity and not understanding what they were doing was completely wrong, mm -hmm. uh, may feel guilt about it. So, okay. you know, it's, it's important to, to, you know, walk with them in the process. Because I'm just thinking, okay, if the abuser goes to get therapy, I mean, should the parent be looking for um, like legal 
ram are there are legal ramifications where you have to press you know do you press charges against you know your own child no, or they wouldn't do that I don't okay think. yeah no. I, I don't know I'm yeah. just like it's up it's up to the parent to report you have to keep this other kids right you know, the abuse parents child. aren't mandated reporters so okay. um, they don't have to report it and I don't think it and it, dep it all depends on the situation it all okay. depends on the situation but you know some children will go on to become adult sexual offenders but studies have shown that a lot of children that receive treatment in time will not continue that okay. behavior so the earlier they catch it and the earlier they get them into treatment the better okay now the non-sibling situation what would the investigative process be like once a child admits to being sexually abused? Mm -hmm. What happens? So basically, if they disclose your not your as an GM, adult, yeah, I mean, right? Exactly. So your child comes to you and says, "This has happened to me." Um, you would file a report with the police, okay. and the police—it's called the 51A. It's a report of child abuse, and then the police would f would begin their investigation. They might decide that there's not enough evidence to even okay. pursue an investigation. It all depends on the t police department and who's in charge of making those decisions. A lot of times I think people have this mentality that reporting abuse is gonna, is gonna solve everything. That you, Oh, if you report abuse, then it's gonna be taken care of. And that's right. not always the case. Unfortunately, child sexual abuse, there's very few instances where there's physical evidence. So oftentimes you're relying on the child's testimony as the only evidence. So it becomes a difficult situation where okay. the the defense and, and also depending say, on the child too, right? Yeah. yeah, how old the child was, and you know how much you know memory they have of it, or what they can say to defend their case. So after the police investigate, they They're, may or may not press charges, right? If they decide, they would send the child to a. Most of the time, they'll send the child to a children's advocacy center, okay. which. Um, I love all the privately run ones. I think they do an amazing job. The child goes in there and it's like a home and it's a three day process where, or not necessarily three days, but three visits. The child goes in and they get to be comfortable with the forensic interviewer. Okay. Because you don't want to just have the child go in there and, and expect them to just Spill their tell guts. everything. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, back in the day, yeah. that's what it would have been. They would have, okay, you tell this person everything that happened to you. Okay, now we're going to do a physical exam. Now you tell this person everything that happened to you. And it's extremely traumatizing yeah. for the child. So children's advocacy centers have been designed to reduce trauma to the child. And everything is recorded so that the investigators don't even have to really talk to the child. They can review these forensic interviews interviews okay. um, that are done you know on a one-on-one -on -one basis in a room with the child in a very comfortable setting so okay. it's actually increased the number of convictions that they've been able to make because of the fact that children feel much more comfortable talking about it which uh, is a great thing now how many cases are from that point on I mean I'm just thinking of a firecracker mm -hmm when they actually go to court how often is the child involved in the whole legal process the the whole criminal is it a criminal it's a cr it would be criminal okay yeah uh, very few make it to the point where they okay. would go to trial we have a lot of supporters on the Facebook page that okay. have reached out to us and it's very frustrating uh, if the, the child sometimes doesn't feel like talking the child's too afraid mm -hmm. and they don't want to have to go through it uh, it's it's a tough call and the parent has to make the right call for the child sometimes the district attorney doesn't feel confident putting the child on the stand. Either they're afraid of traumatizing the child, or they don't feel as though it's going to be able to make the impact they want to make, okay. and they want the convictions. Okay. So, now if someone's convicted, is there kind of like a, a spreadsheet or something of what the penalties are? Is it a fine? Is it jail time? Is it you know, probation, or does it all depend on how good your lawyer is? It all depends on the prosecutor. It depends on the judge. It depends on the state. Okay. Um, it can really vary. Because I'm just thinking, you know, drunk driving laws, it's like, okay, the first yeah. conviction is this, the second yeah. this, you know. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, has yeah. that been standardized? or? Well, no, not I really? think, honestly, I think a lot of people spend time in jail for much, you know, minor offenses than child sexual abuse. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that even judges don't always have that much uh, empathy for children. So occasionally you'll hear the, the case in court where the judge will actually blame the child 
there was a, co a case a few months ago where it was a 13 year old girl and the judge said that she knew what was going on and she had she was just as much in control as her 40 year old teacher was so you know it's these judges She's 13 yeah yeah you're kind of like where where's your common yeah. sense but judges are people just like everyone else so right. you get I think good they ones need to be educated yeah well that's the thing too yeah. they're not they're yeah. not sitting behind that bench too yes. long I'm probably annoying every judge that's <laughs> watching right now. Okay, um, I think we talked about this a little bit, but how do you teach your child to avoid the dangerous situation that could potentially lead to, lead to abuse? I think the number one way that we promote it is talking about instincts. That whenever you get that funny mm -hmm. feeling in your belly and you feel like something's not right, that you should listen to it, that it's trying to tell you something. Okay. Your instinct is always there to protect you. It's okay. not there to do anything else but say, I feel like my body is not going to be safe in this situation. And we, as adults, a lot of times we convince ourselves to ignore our instincts that, oh okay. no, I'm, you know, you might see someone that's a little sketchy and you're just like, oh no, you know what, you're just being, you're, you're blowing this out of proportion. And so we have this mentality, okay. you know, to kind of ignore it. But, you know, really, we need to trust ourselves more because even if we're wrong, we're still right in the fact that we're doing what we need to do to protect okay. ourselves and our kids. And that whole gut instinct thing would protect the child because you had mentioned, you know, the whole grooming, you know, yeah. get in on the good side of the parents, yeah. get in the, you know. Well, I There's think always a point where, okay, no lo this is no longer comfortable. Right. Well, at that point, that child is in, most likely in a one-on-one -on -one situation with the person. Okay. So it's also on us to take responsibility for minimizing the one-on-one -on -one situations we allow our children to be in. So that oh. is actually in the number one way um, the experts say that we can protect children is by minimizing those opportunities. Because if the opportunities do not exist, then the children do not have to take responsibility for their own oh, safety. Okay. So if it's sometimes in, that can't be avoided. It though. can't be avoided all the time, but we can try to minimize it. Say, for example, you're in the house and say you have multiple kids. If they're playing down in the basement and you you might think, oh great, this is an opportunity for read my book for an hour. You might want to just pop in after 20 minutes and say, hey guys, what's going on? You know, a lot of times, you know, around the holidays, we do a lot of promotion about being cognizant of the fact that you have a lot of people in your house, mm -hmm. people are busy, and you might be having fun talking with people you haven't seen in a long time, and you're not think you're thinking my kids are in the safest place in the world, and that's not always the case. Uh, it can be very easy to put a child in a one-on-one -on -one situation, up in a bedroom, a bathroom, uh, and so it's important to to make more people aware of this opportunity and just okay. keep your eyes open, be vigilant. So especially, you know, when it in terms of putting your children once they're older um, in youth serving organizations, okay. um, if your child is doing sports or tutoring, if a tutor is offering to tutor your child in their home, choose a different location. Yeah. You want a neutral Why don't location. Why you meet at the library? Right. Meet at the library where there are other people or you have it in your house. Um, I did a blog post a couple weeks ago, my daughter goes to ballet, and the ballet that she was going to, they had a downstairs play area. Oh, I think There's, I read part yeah. of it. Keep telling there me, There was no me. observation, there was nothing, and the way you came into the building was from the first floor, and you went up to the dance studio, and the play area was also on the first floor. Anyone could come in from that first floor and go into that playroom, and the adults upstairs would have no idea what was going on. And I never this let is my a parent. I wouldn't let my kid there. You know, sexual abuse aside, I mean, right. there could be just the kid could wander off. Right. And, right. But know. some of these kids are old enough where they they feel confident that this child isn't just going to oh, wander out the door okay. if the child's seven, eight, nine, ten years old. But at the same time, they're still at risk for peer on peer oh, abuse or another okay. parent. So just from my knowledge, yeah. it always made me feel a little uncomfortable. But okay. I knew other parents, you know, after a while I kind of realized that that was the situation. They were letting their kids go down there. But, you know, since then they've, they've moved to a new location. So oh, okay. the whole situation's been rectified. But, you know, once I kind of got that feeling, I was like, okay, I'm going to need to say something to the owner. But then they moved. So it oh, kind of, it was okay. a good thing. But just to be aware of situations like that. Because we're very trusting sometimes. Okay. I think we touched upon this a little bit. But what are specific signs? i got to read my my cheat sheet that a parent should look for if they suspect that their child has been abused. Mm -hmm. 
basically you, the number one thing you want to look for is a change in behavior. It doesn't, okay. it, it can be anything. It can be your child's eating more, your child's eating less. Your child's sleeping a lot and staying in bed, your child can't sleep. If there's regression in potty training or, you know, having nightmares, they're, if they're, they're doing really poorly in school and neglecting their studies when before they were doing mm -hmm. really well, or all of a sudden they're burying themselves in their books and studying like oh, there's, okay. you know, like the midterm exam is coming and it's just all the time. So, you know, there's a lot, you just have to be cognizant of your children. If you see something, it doesn't mean that, that that's the problem, but if it doesn't go away, you know what, it's just something there's you should something consider. something going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't let it go. Don't just assume that it's just a, a, just a change in personality. Okay. Just, you know, be vigilant. Now, on the flip side, are there what are some specific signs that a parent could see if they suspect someone is an abuser? Mm -hmm. If they're targeting the family, um, someone that's looking to build up your trust in them, someone that's very uh, eager to try to insert like themselves an eagerness? in your family. Yeah, okay. they feel like they're really, trying too hard. To yeah, thing? trying. Yeah, you're like, wow, this person really wants to be my best friend, or someone that's really helpful. Anytime, really, someone offers to babysit your kids, like, who really wants to babysit kids? <laughs> Let's be honest. If someone's like, hey, I'll babysit your kids sometime, you're like, why? Yeah. Really? Like. Why would you, like, yeah. that doesn't sound like fun to me. But, so, you know, that case up in Wakefield where, that, where that um, he was a convicted sexual offender and his wife had the daycare. Uh, and he was taking care of children. I heard from other people that he, they were going around offering to babysit people's kids. So That's kind of creepy that the wife was okay with that. Yeah, well, that's one of the, the you know, she was, it was probably a codependency. She okay. was kind of feeding into his uh, okay. issue because she probably just didn't want to be alone or, you know, unfortunately she probably had a weak constitution and, you know, she was a vulnerable person. Mm. So she made bad decisions, you know, and yeah. was thinking more about herself than anyone else. But, I mean, someone that is looking to be alone with your child. Someone that's saying, oh, hey, I'll take so-and-so out. Oh, I want to take her to the movies. Oh, let's have, you know, oh, I'm going to take you over here. And it's, it seems to give your child more attention, whether they're okay. being really affectionate, touching them a lot, not respecting their personal boundaries, um, if they're giving them gifts, mm -hmm. and they just seem to give them preferential treatment over uh, other okay. children. Um, just be aware of who who is paying attention to your child. They could be... You know, if you're a, sp a lot of times, if you're into sports, your child has a natural talent for something. Mm -hmm. Someone may come into your life and be very interested in your child's talent and wants to progress the talent when oh, really they're looking okay. for access to the child. That's a very oh, common situation okay. for children in sports. I remember that on uh, Law and Order. Oh yeah, yeah. A Law and Order like Special Victims Unit. They yeah. cover they cover a lot of real cases. I never got into SVU, but yeah. I used to watch yeah. like the the original law right. and order. Yeah. And yeah. So what are ways to begin to correct or fix the problem of an abusive situation? You may, we mentioned therapy. Is that like our only option or? I think therapy is obviously a great start. Um, talking about it is definitely important especially We're talking about it before it actually right happens. right yeah okay. talking about it before during and after um, but there's a lot of ways for children to um, go through a healing process from trauma obviously it has involved losing control over your body mm -hmm. so a lot of people um, do things like yoga or equine assisted therapy that involve building up your self-confidence in your body uh. and feeling in control of yourself again um, there's also a lot of um, effort being involved in researching the benefits of writing, just writing. Oh, okay. Just self-expression. Yeah, on your Facebook page, you were looking for victims of sexual, you know, child sexual abuse to tell their stories. So there was another page that I was working oh, okay. with. Yeah. Now, is that 
because of a therapeutic thing or was that you were just trying to gather data? I think or? they were trying to gather data for a, a oh, book okay. or something like that. Okay. But um, I mean a lot of people come to me and you know tell me their story so I'm always you know open to listening to it so and then people will you know offer information about how they have healed through the process. Um, so actually I have a lot of it listed on my website because um, a lot of people have reached out to me in terms of what has worked for them. So, But I think if people feel like something isn't working for them, it doesn't mean that they're broken. It just means that they need to try a different avenue. Okay. Now when we talked about, you know, again, stream of consciousness, we talked about signs that your child could be a victim. I'm thinking, you know, would like, you know, you mentioned control, would eating disorders play? Is there a link between eating disorders as well? Absolutely. Yeah, because a lot of times eating disorders isn't necessarily about your body appearance. It's okay. about being in control of something. And so these children, they've been in this horrible situation. They feel like they need to control something, and they try to control their eating. Okay. So they limit their eating. Uh, but then a lot of times, and then it can be the opposite. They're overeating because it's an emotional thing. You know, okay. or if you see all of a sudden your child starts to cover up wearing more clothing and feeling very protective oh, over being okay. seen um, or exposed, that could be another sign. I mean, there's, okay. there's just so much, you know, and a lot of parents come out to us and, and talk to us about how they missed these signs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they shouldn't feel any guilt about it because there's so little awareness to it. So that they, it's like how can they even know that this is a risk for their children when okay. so little is being done? Now, we just have a couple minutes left, so I have two more questions that I definitely want to get in. Okay. How would someone go about helping the mission of the Mama Bear Effect? Either volunteering or donating? I mean, do you accept volunteers, or is there anything for someone to do? Absolutely. Uh, locally, yeah. I try to do parades, community events. Um, a lot of people will reach out to me wanting to do a door hanger campaign and organizing a group to just distribute information. Okay. Um, it's, I mean, we're a small nonprofit, so even if we're sending out mailers to people, just address mailers for us is a huge oh, thing. Okay. But anytime they can share this information, I really just welcome people, to, instead of looking at the problem as this big issue where, oh my gosh, all these children are being sexually abused, I can't mm -hmm. help them, focus on a smaller area. Focus on your direct communities. Focus on your family and friends. Educate those people so that your child has a net of protection of people that are educated oh, okay. and kind of branch out from there. Oh, okay, kind of build that little safety zone. Yeah, yeah. Now, you had mentioned that Mama Bear Effect, you read the article in 2012. When did you become a 501C3? Last summer. C3. Okay, so you've been around six months? As a 501C3, which all the donations were retroactive to 2012. Okay. But Okay. Where, so within the last three years, where do you see the Mama Bear effect going, like within the next five mm -hmm. years or ten years or? Well, the one you thing know, that eventually people... Eventually you want obsolescence, but... Right, exactly. You know. I want to put myself out of business. Um, the one thing that people had been asking for and I finally started doing a couple months ago, people wanted to do chapters. Or they wanted to be volunteer advocates for oh. their communities across okay. the country. So as I've come to know some people uh, through Facebook and social media, they follow the page and get involved, I have said, okay, let's give this a go. So I've given them business cards, educational materials, and you know, a code of conduct to follow and basically I want from them is how do you want to raise awareness in your community? What can we do together? And you know, we'll raise a little bit of funding to help cover the costs because unfortunately, I'm not going to have enough coming in to keep up, keep it up going. Right. Um, every donation that comes in directly goes to funding educational materials. I mean, I live, eat, and sleep child sexual abuse prevention, yes. but I don't. It's not a job for me. I, okay. I put more money into this business okay. than, you know, my husband said to me, oh, you know, you've got so many Amazon packages <laughs> coming in, like you need to get a job. So then I got a job that, that I pay to uh -huh. do. <laughs> so, but uh, obviously, you know, the benefits for, for my soul have been, Excellent. you know, exponential. Well, 
we are out of time. So I want to thank you very much yeah, for coming. For having and me. thank you for celebrating my 50th I know. episode. Woo! Thank you. So, and I do want to thank everyone at home for tuning in and watching and hope you learned as much as I did. Have a safe evening, safe day, safe weekend, and I will see you around town. Thanks so much. Good night.